thank you for the introduction and the invitation. It's great to great to be here um, virtually. Uh, so I will talk about uh, some joint work uh, with Balint Iraq, who's in Toronto, and uh, Yun Li, my graduate student, uh, who's also in uh, UW Medicine. So the the starting point of the talk is is something that uh, Emma talked a lot about in in the previous talk. It's the circular unitary ensemble. It's one of the classical random matrix models. Um, so these are just uh, the eigenvalues of a uniformly chosen n by n unitary matrix. So these will be, of course, on the unit circle. So you can write it this way. Um, I will choose the angles, the phases, um, to be between minus pi and pi. It's not super important, but it will be uh, convenient. Uh, it's one of the one of the nicest uh, models uh, you can you can study in in random matrix theory. Uh, it has lots of nice properties, and we heard uh, about some of those in in the previous talk. Um, of course, it's well known that these uh, eigenvalues have a nice uh, joint probability density function. You have some normalizing co constant, and then this Wondermond squared. We also know that, that uh, these um, eigenvalues have nice scaling properties. So you have n points on the unit circle. Um, if you zoom in, so here are your eigenvalues. Here is one. You can think about zooming in near this point and scale this in a way that um, you're hoping to get a nice uh, limit, a point process limit. Of course, you would like to scale it so that the average distance between the neighboring uh, points, which is of order one over n in this case, will become order one. So uh, you would blow up the whole picture by n. So uh, that just means that okay, if you look at the angles, the eigen angles now, and I put a, an extra index there or a superscript to show that the dependence on n, then if you scale this with n, so blue up uh, or zoom in near the angle zero, then this will have a point process limit. And I will call this the sine two process. And this process is, um, again, this is a classical result. Sine two is a determinant of point process on the real line. Um, we can have it an explicit kernel, the sine kernel. Um, and as we heard uh, again uh, towards the end of the previous talk, it has uh, nice connections to number theory. Um, and this is because the famous Montgomery Dyson conjecture, which states that if you look at the critical zeros of the Riemann zeta function, so these are these are the zeros um, on this critical line where the real part is equal to one half, and of course. Uh, According to the Riemann conjecture, in um, the appropriate uh, region, all of the all of the zeros should be on the critical line. So the Montgomery Dyson conjecture states that the zeros, the critical zeros of the Riemann zeta function, sort of look like the sine two process. Uh, I will not make this precise, but you can make it precise. Um, basically, uh, viewed from a random point from a random position 
after some rescaling, this zero set looks like the sign to process. Okay, you can you can make this statement uh, precise. I will not do that. And at this point, I have to come clean. Guillaume advertised the two talks of the afternoon as as talks connected to number theory. Uh, this is the last point when I talk about number theory. So this is uh, this Montgomery Dyson conjecture is basically uh, a motivation for the name uh, and and the object we are studying. But uh, from this point on, there will be no number theory uh, in the talk. So if you if you have if you look at this conjecture. Um, and you say, okay, the sign two process is nine nice point process coming from the circular unitary ensemble is somehow connected to the zeros of the, the Riemann zeta function. Then it's it's natural to further conjecture that if we somehow build a random entire function with zeros that are given by sign two, so. So a random entire function with zero set which is the sign two should look like the zeta function itself of course there are various ways you can build an entire function with a with a given uh, zero set so here we are thinking about some some canonical way uh, of doing it, and and one would hope that okay, maybe can uh, upgrade the Montgomery Dyson conjecture uh, to say something more about the connection. So um, a couple of years ago, um, three years ago, Reda Chaibi, Joseph Najnudel, and Ashka Nikekbali. Look at this problem from the sign pro, sign to process point of view and try to construct this canonical entire function. And he, here's the function that uh, they constructed. I will call this zeta two. So you do you do the following. You essentially take a principal value product of the linear term terms coming from the sine two points, and then take take the limit of these products. Actually, uh, this is not the exact formula that they they considered. They uh, they used a slightly different regularization, but they, uh, their definition is equivalent to to this definition. So it's a ne very natural uh, choice. Um, you essentially try try to fit a, a polynomial. Uh, for given given roots, uh, but then you want to have in the end an entire function. You have to take some sort of sort of a limit, um, and that's that's the limit um, that they took. So this is the function that uh, we will call the stochastic zeta function. Note that this is normalized so that at zero this is equal to one, um, and what they proved uh, in in this paper, they proved several things. Uh, of course, very nice, very nice results. Uh, first of all, they showed that this random entire function with the zero set sign two is the limit of the normalized characteristic functions or characteristic polynomials. And they could even get a, a very strong uh, convergence where they coupled uh, the finite models uh, to this limit point process and they had almost sure uh, limit. And they stated a conjecture that um, if you look at zeta near a random point on the critical line, Then, then zeta will look like zeta two, this random function. So again, this would be like a um, an extended version 
of, uh, of the original uh, Montgomery Dyson uh, conjecture. Okay, you have to normalize uh, the, the zeta function so that where you, where you zoom in uh, your reference point, uh, the, the value is equal to one, but otherwise uh, the conjecture that you would see in the limit, uh, this random analytic function. Okay, so what is the, the goal of this talk? We, I will show you um, some new tools, new characterizations and new tools for this uh, stochastic zeta function. And I will, will show you how to um, how to find uh, similar objects uh, for other uh, models. So And one of the one of the specific generalizations that you could you should keep in mind, um, at least in the first half of the of the talk is, um, is the beta generalization of the circular unitary ensemble. So this is the circular beta ensemble. If you read, it's, it's not connected to to random matrix model, or though we will will see that uh, you can you can uh, find random matrices uh, for this. This is just uh, n points, n random points on the unit circle, and we just generalize the joint density function. by having an exponent beta in the Vendermont as opposed to the exponent two. Okay, so this is a finite ensemble for beta equals two. This is just the circular unitary ensemble. Here I want, and I want to mention uh, another result here. This particular uh, ensemble will also have a point process scaling limit. So the point process Scaling limit will be denoted by sine beta. So this is just sort of like, like a beta generalization of the sine two process. Uh, the point process limit was uh, first derived by Kilip and Stoichu, and then um, we later with Balint uh, we gave other characterizations for it and showed that it's the same as the bulk point process limit. Of uh, of the Gaussian uh, beta ensemble, right? So so as you can see, this is this is sort of a board talk, tablet talk. So it means that probably I might not get to everything that I wanted to get to. So I want to just sort of uh, highlight a couple of results at the beginning. Hopefully, I will be able to come back to those uh, towards the end of end of the talk. So here, uh, I just want to show you some of the new characterizations for uh, for this stochastic zeta function. And actually it will be for the beta generalization, but you can just pretend that wherever you see beta, that beta is two. Um, so here is, here is one uh, description of this random uh, an entire function. Um, we need a couple of ingredients. So beta B1 and B2 are independent two-sided Brownian motions. And I will also need another random variable Q, which is an independent Cauchy And now I will show you show you a, a construction, an explicit. Uh, construction for building from these ingredients, so just from two Brownian motions and an independent Cauchy random variable, the random entire function uh, of uh, of Chai B, Nudge Nudel, and Nikki Bad. So what, what do we do here? So I will introduce a, a sequence of uh, diffusion processes. There will be a, a recursion, the first two terms are um, just constant, so A0 will be just constant one, B0 will be constant 
uh, zero and we can just define recursively and i always tell this to my students my hand, handwriting is not very nice so please stop me if there's something that you don't uh, you cannot read here it's especially bad because i have to use n and u and those are very similar when i write them so i will try to differentiate between them okay so b n u um, which is a process in u is defined uh, the following way okay so this is just an integral involving one of the previously defined processes and e and u will be similar but with a slightly different integral formula So it can be shown that these diffusion processes are all well defined. I want to just point out one thing here. So if you look at this guy in, in the first case, first non-trivial case, when n is equal to one, then this ingredient, the A, is just equal to one. So you can just disregard this term. And what you see here is the integral of an exponential Brownian motion with a negative drift, essentially. We are integrating on the negative half line, so it's with a positive drift. But this is uh, the well-known Dufresne integral. So in particular, you can just find the uh, distribution. It will be an uh, inverse gamma distribution for B1 at a specific uh, position. Okay, so these are my diffusion processes and now i the result that we have that this stochastic zeta function and again you can just consider the beta equals uh two case uh can be written in a taylor expansion in the following way where the taylor coefficients are just given by the values of these diffusion processes at time zero so again uh, you just start with these two brownian emotions and this extra Cauchy uh, random variable, which only shows up here. And then you can just directly construct the Taylor coefficients uh, of this of this random entire function. Here's another another representation. As the solution of a stochastic differential equation. Um, Again, you can see that somehow the Q uh, here, this Cauchy just sort of shows up at the, at the last minute. Um, it's the same here. So the, the stochastic zeta function can be written as um, is the following formula here. H uh, is the solution of of an SDE. It's a analytic function valued SDE, but this is just a fancy way of saying that there is a there is an extra parameter um, in your in your SDE. Okay, so H here is uh, a vector, a two-dimensional vector, and it's just the solution, um, this process, this vector valued process, which depends on some time parameter, say U, and also a complex parameter, let's call it Z. Um, and if you take the solution uh, of, this, of this SDE, then uh, at time zero, you can just get uh, your uh, zeta function. Basically, what if you compare it with the uh, with the previous expression? Uh, these guys coming from the a's and the b's uh, will form the two coordinates of this uh, of this vector. Okay, you also need uh, some sort of boundary condition uh, at 
at minus infinity. So uh, what we what we actually have in order to uh, to have a unique solution of this is that we also assume that at minus infinity, time minus infinity, uh, this analytic function is uh, is basically the constant vector one zero. Okay, so so we have a couple of other representations, and hopefully I um, I get to do uh, during the talk, but I just wanted to throw these out uh, at the beginning um, to show you that we have this nice construction with these Brownian motion ingredient, and then they actually work for for all values uh, of beta. Okay, so how um, how do we get these these characterizations? Um, if you have your random matrix. And you want to find the the eigenvalues. Of course, one possibility is to just go through the the characteristic polynomial, right? And we have seen um, the nice sort of point process results that if you scale the eigen eigenvalues, then you will have some sort of nice point process in the end. And we we are trying to trying to understand what goes here, what will be the limit. Uh, of the characteristic polynomial, what kind of random entire function we can construct um, with that particular uh, zero set. Of course, one one possibility would be to just uh, go from the point process and and uh, create uh, a function with that zero set, and that's exactly what we have seen in the definition uh, that I showed you um, a couple of minutes ago. Another approach would be to somehow try try to complete this picture and try to find some sort of a limit on the top level, on the level of the random matrices. So if you want to have some sort of limiting object, then um, you could maybe hope for a random operator to appear in the limit. And once you find that random operator, then you can try to get an entire function, a natural entire function uh, from from that random operator. Okay, so so that's that's what we are uh, trying to trying to do. So how can we how can we get these random operators? So lots of people worked on this, and and there were various different uh, approaches. The uh, the path that we are following was was started by various uh, works of Edelman, Alan Edelman. So uh, first, Dumichiu and Edelman found random tridiagonal matrix representation for certain beta ensembles. The Gaussian beta ensemble and the Logger beta ensemble. And then Edelman and Sutton looked at these tridiagonal matrices and said, okay, I want to scale the, uh, the spectrum, the eigenvalues, to get something meaningful, a point process in the limit. But maybe I, I can scale these tridiagonal matrices. Uh, and then we will get something nice here, and and that's that's what they uh, that's what they did. So um, they found random differential operators as limits of random tridiagonal matrices. In a sort of conjectural way, but they identified uh, these the random differential operators that should come up in the limit uh, from these um, from these random tridiagonal matrices after uh, the appropriate scaling. Um, and and the idea was basically that okay, if you have a, a differential operator and you discretize it, um, then this discrete version will become um, if you have, say, a second-order differential operator, it will become a tridiagonal matrix. So now you can go sort of the other way, and if you have the random tridiagonal matrix, apply the scaling, and you try to find um, this sort of limiting differential operators there. So uh, 
Edelman's uh, program um, was completed um, the last, I don't know, 15 years uh, for the edge of um, of these Gaussian and Logair beta ensembles. Um, it was done by Ramirez, Ryder, and Virag for the hard edge. It was done by Ramirez and Ryder. And uh, eventually for, for the bulk, uh, this was uh, joint work with, uh, with Balin. Um, and for the soft edge and the hard edge, uh, the found random differential operators are uh, second order differential operators or like sturm liouville type uh, differential operators. What we found in the bulk is that we have so-called Dirac operators appearing. Um, I will tell you in a second what that means exactly, but uh, these are sort of relatives, close relatives of, uh, of sturm liouville differential operators. These are first order, but two-dimensional um, differential operators. So let, let me let me just give you a, a little bit of background on, on these, these operators. So we will talk a little bit about the random Dirac operators. So what we found um, and in this 2017 paper with Balin, that for a number of, uh, of finite ensembles and point process limits, you can realize use ensembles, so either the finite ensembles or uh, or the limiting point process, as the spectrum of certain special type or special structure random differential operators. And these are these random Dirac operators. So what is the structure? So as I mentioned, this is a first order differential operator, but it acts on vectors. And just for simplicity, let's let's assume that these functions all live on on the interval uh, zero one. So if you just look at this part here, so you you have f prime just first derivative, and then it's multiplied by this two by two matrix. This two by two matrix is essentially the matrix version of the imaginary unity i. Okay, if you if you square this, you will get the identity matrix. And if you just look at this part right here, with this uh, matrix multiplication, the first derivative operator will become a self-adjoint differential operator. So this right here is somehow the most natural differential operator you can uh, consider in this setup. And the additional ingredients that we have here is this OR function. So RT is just, uh, a two by two positive definite matrix volute function. So that's that's our extra uh, sort of parameter in our in our operator. So again, these type of differential operators that that you that you see here, these are sort of uh, part of uh, a family called uh, Dirac differential operators, and it's really uh, you know, a classical uh, theory of uh, of differential operators, and and they share lots of um, properties with the uh, the sturm liouville uh, time differential operators. So, a lot of things are known uh, about these uh, these guys. So, in order to to have uh, a proper differential operator, it's of course always useful to identify the domain. Uh, of, of the operator. So here we get this uh, differential operator on finite interval. So we need boundary conditions to make the domain precise. We also need some differentiability 
conditions. We want to make sure that F prime is well defined. And in order to, to have a nice self-adjoint operator, you also need some, some L2 conditions. And again, this is all classical, and then you can uh, precisely describe uh, the domain uh, of this operator so that it becomes, um, becomes self-adjoint. You have some freedom in the choice of the boundary uh, conditions. Uh, you can basically set the direction of your function at zero and at one. Now, because two by two matrices, um, positive definite matrices don't have that many variables. There are various other ways of, of representing them. Uh, here, uh, a nice representation uh, is the following. So we can, we can encode this function or this matrix for fun valued function or get a path in the upper half plane so this is just those complex numbers with where the imaginary part is positive in other words x is a real number and y is positive and then you can basically take a square root from this positive definite matrix RT and um, the square root of this of this matrix can be just parameterized with this X and Y. Okay, so, so the point here uh, is, is that the ingredients, the main ingredients of, of this differential operator can be represented just uh, by a path in in the upper half plane. You can represent the boundary conditions as boundary points. So two boundary points. So so your whole differential operator tau is encoded in this sort of geometric information. You can think about the upper half plane as uh, as the hyperbolic uh, plane, and you just have a path in the hyperbolic plane uh, with two boundary points. As I mentioned, this is sort of classical theory, and and lots of things are are known about these, um, and these are really nice uh, differential operators. I want to mention one thing that uh, will be important uh, to us that if you look at the inverse uh, of these differential operators and you assume something about uh, the path, then the inverse will be super nice. So tau itself, as I mentioned, is a self-adjoint differential operators. When you have something like this, then uh, you have an unbounded uh, spectrum, right? But tau inverse will be uh, a nice bounded operator. In fact, it'll be, it will be an integral operator, which uh, will have a finite Hilbert-Schmidt norm. So, so inverse uh, is a self-adjoint Hilbert-Schmidt integral operator. And we can write down the kernel explicit explicitly. And in that formula, you just need, again, this, the ingredients, so the path, uh, and these two boundary points, uh, which you need to to identify the domain. Okay, so it means that we have we have these very nice integral operators. If you look at the the inverses uh, of these uh, of these guys, so I mentioned that that we found um, several several uh, ensembles uh, from random matrix theory where you can use this representation. So, in particular. If uh, for sine beta, which is um, the point process limit of, of the circular beta ensemble, uh, or uh, the bulk limit of the Gaussian beta ensemble, uh, this path that encodes uh, your, uh, your differential operator is just uh, a hyperbolic Brownian motion 
in the upper half plane with um, with a time change. And the time change is the only part where beta shows up. So in order to make this path live on the zero one interval, so the, the time parameter is zero one, we have to uh, transform the time parameter and using this logarithmic function, uh, we get exactly sort of the driving path of, uh, of the diffusion operator or the differential operator corresponding to, to this process. Okay, and another result that uh, is uh, relevant for this talk is that for if you have finite ensembles, from a random unitary matrix with eigenvalues, which are again, that's exponential of i times theta j, then the corresponding differential operator uh, will have uh, a path which is a random walk. So it will be a piecewise constant path, but you can just uh, look at it uh, as a random walk. And the spectrum of the corresponding differential operator will be a periodic extension of your original eigen angles. With an extra uh, sort of magnification, exactly the magnification that you would expect in the point process limit. Okay, it's actually not a probabilistic statement, so it's a, uh, a deterministic uh, statement that if you have a unitary matrix, then you can encode the spectral information in that unitary matrix with that with a differential operator uh, that is of this form, this Dirac differential operator. Okay, so um, now if you if you have these, we have all these operators. So the question is, how can we get uh, a natural entire function uh, from such an operator? Okay, of course, if you if you have a matrix. Then if you look at the scaled or, or normalized characteristic polynomial, uh, let's assume that the eigenvalues are non-zero. Then you can just look at the following determinant. And then this guy will be, will be the characteristic polynomial with the actual, with the additional normalization that at zero it's equal to one. So this is just the characteristic polynomial normalization at zero. So now you have you have an operator itself adjoined, so you have nice real eigenvalues. Um, What's what's a natural guess? A natural guess would be to to just do the same um, for for the operator as well, right? So if you have uh, a nice enough operator, then you can also define a determinant like this, right? And if everything works out then again, we just have a nice entire function, which is the product of these, uh, of these linear terms. Now, there's a, there's a problem with this. In order to uh, properly define this infinite product, we have to have some assumptions um, about the individual terms. In particular, uh, this is only defined, so this is well defined if, this inverse operator is trace class. So 
So we need this sum, one over the absolute value of lambda k, to be finite, right? Uh, otherwise, this, this infinite product uh, wouldn't uh, converge absolutely. So unfortunately, this is not true. So this does not hold. For our point processes, the point processes that we are interested in, like the sine two or the sine beta, will have eigenvalues or points that will grow linearly with a linear speed, right? And because of that, uh, in that case, this sum is infinite, right? So, okay, if if this determinant is is not well defined, then you try to look at what other versions of determinants. Uh, could be well defined, and there is something called uh, the modified or regularized determinant, which again starts with a similar formula, but it includes an extra regularization term. So now this linear term will become basically quadratic when when you're looking at this uh, look at the expansion of uh, of the exponential function so if you want to have this particular uh, infinite product converge you only need sort of like an l2 condition right and we do have that so this is true because tau inverse is a Hilbert-Schmidt integral operator, right? So the, <coughs> excuse me, the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues of tau inverse, and that's exactly the sum that you see here, uh, will be finite. Okay, so this is well defined, but now we sort of modified our function. Um, so, and we still want to get some version of the of the previous determinant where I have those linear uh, terms multiplied together. So how how can we get that? So for a trace class tau inverse, there is a very simple connection between this regularized determinant and the original one. You can just basically collect all these exponential terms together. And you just have an additional term, additional exponential term with the trace of tau inverse. Okay. Now again, it's still a problem that, trow, uh, that the trace of tau inverse is not defined in our case. But in some sense, it's almost defined. So if you have a, a trace class integral operator, then there are various ways to write uh, this trace. Uh, for example, you can just write it as, uh, as the integral of your kernel on the diagonal, right? And it turns out uh, that this integral for R operators will be finite. And another way is that, okay, the trace should be the sum of uh, the eigenvalue, sum of one over lambda k. Maybe it's not absolutely convergent, but maybe maybe you, you have uh, a principal value limit. And that's exactly what, what happens. So the real trees doesn't exist, but we have this sort of fake version which is the principal value sum. And this is also equal to the integral trace that you get from your integral operator. So just integrate it on, again, this is a matrix value, the integral operator. So you have to integrate the trace of the kernel on the diagonal. Again, it's important that because we have an explicit formula for the kernel of, um, for this integral operator, we will have an explicit formula for this integral trace as well. Okay, so even though the, the real trace is not defined, we have this sort of 
pretty good approximation, which is basically the trees. So now um, we can define the following function for a Dirac operator tau. We know that it's uh, the inverse is Hilbert Schmidt. So I can just take this modified determinant and then I include this additional exponential term. And I use essentially the integral trees, okay? Which is again not the real trees because this is not trees class, but it basically uh, plays the role of the trees. So this is a very nice um, analytic function, entire function. It has really nice analytic properties. So uh, Benedek, may I ask yes. a question? Sure. Uh, uh, why you didn't use this trick uh, directly for the product? So, you know, to do the product of, uh, um, I mean, the principal value, but for the product of uh, of, of the, de what would be the determinant, uh, maybe there is something I, uh, right, would it so work? It's, it's a good question. So what we, what we want um, are sort of, other ways to, to attack this function. And we wanted to have a nice analytic representation. And, and these, uh, these determinants, they, are, they have really, really nice uh, analytic properties. Uh, in the end, we could, we could show that uh, what we get is exactly the same as the principal value product of, uh, of these linear terms. But because we went through uh, these determinants as a byproduct, we got a bunch of other tools that we could use to get these other characterizations. You have nice yeah, uh, thanks to that. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so what are these nice analytic properties? For example, uh, the dependence on the operator in this formula is very well understood and very, very nice. So if, if we have a sequence of operators and tau inverse converges in Hilbert Schmidt norm, and this sort of fake trees, the integral trees converges, then the corresponding analytic functions will also converge uniformly on compacts. And if you have some control over the speed of convergence, then you can actually get uh, explicit bounds uh, here. So why is this useful? Because the remember that tau inverse is encoded with this, or tau itself is, is encoded um, with just a path in the hyperbolic plane and, um, and those boundary points. So in order to, to somehow understand the convergence of tau inverse, you need uh, the convergence of the ingredients. So the path and these boundary volumes. So now you can study the scaling limit um, of, these, of these generating paths. And if you have a good enough control, and it's not just uh, the convergence uh, in distribution. You also have some. You also need to get some sort of control over the tails, um, and that's usually sort of the uh, the harder part. But if you can do that, from that you get uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt convergence of your operators, and also often uh, the convergence of this integral trees. And then this implies the convergence of um, of the characteristic polynomials, the normalized characteristic polynomials to this uh, analytic function that we co uh, constructed. So we, we did that uh, sort of program for a uh, circular beta ensemble. So this is joined with, again, with Balint. And we could get uh, a coupling there um, these uh, we could get explicit bounds on the distance between the paths. This gave us explicit bounds uh, for the Hilbert-Schmidt distance um, between the operators. 
and in the end bounds uh, on the difference between uh, these characteristic polynomials um, and the limiting uh, analytic function. And another uh, model that uh, we can do is a further generalization of the circular beta ensemble, the Hua Pickerel ensemble, sometimes this is called the circular Jacobi ensemble. So here you need an extra parameter to describe the density function. This extra parameter delta, which will satisfy uh, some condition, um, will show up in an extra term. in your density function. So the QOPKL ensemble is just a generalization of the circular beta ensemble. If you take delta equals zero, then you just get back the same uh, density function. Um, but um, we can we can derive the limit um, here in the in the general delta case as well. Uh, know that if delta is a half integer times beta, then this last part sort of looks like something like this, which shows that, that this uh, ensemble, uh, at least for those specific delta values, can be considered as, as like a conditional version of the circular beta ensemble where uh, we uh, sort of glue a couple of particles at one. So here, if you have K here, then it would mean that we glued K particles uh, at the position one. So this um, this model has, um, you know, very nice uh, properties. Um, and, and the whole story starts uh, from results of, uh, uh, Burge, Burgad, uh, Nikek Bali, and Ellen Rowe from 2009. So they uh, produced a random matrix model for the general Hua Pickel uh, ensemble uh, using. Um, orthogonal polynomials on the unit circle um, and taking a uh, certain modified version of uh, Verbulinski coefficients. And if you take, if you take these, uh, this description, uh, now you can sort of feed this into the machine uh, that, we, that we built up. So in our 2017 paper, we described um, of the corresponding uh, Dirac operators, random Dirac operators. And the random walk that um, that is needed uh, to, to generate this random Dirac operator. We also uh, describe the scaling limit of the random walk and that, ran, that scaling limit was basically a, a version of a hyperbolic Brownian motion where there's an additional drift is introduced, so a fairly simple diffusion process on the upper half plane. We also uh, described the, the operator corresponding to this limit, but we didn't have the full proof because we didn't have the control uh, over the tails uh, of this process. Uh, Theo Asiotis and Theo shows up uh, in these talks uh, today a lot, and, and Joseph as well. So Theo and Joseph, uh, 
show the existence of the point process limit. of these Hugh or PQL or circular Jacobi ensemble with a, with a different uh, approach. Um, and then together with uh, Yoon, we now sort of uh, filled in the gap and we have an operator level convergence uh, for these uh, for these models. So from the finite ensemble to the, the limiting uh, random differential operator, and with this, uh, we have uh, the ingredients to describe uh, the the random and entire function that you get as the limit of the normalized characteristic polynomials. And again, we can we can have a similar Taylor expansion that I showed you at the beginning of uh, of the talk and also stochastic differential uh, equation description. There are a couple of other characterizations that I'm, but I'm running out of time, so I just mentioned it super briefly. Um, because your Dirac operator is just a differential operator, you can look at the shooting problem for finding eigenvalues, and this leads to a one-parameter system of ordinary differential equations that gives another um, description of, of the entire function. Uh, you can also have a sort of fret home determinantal type expansion uh, for this entire function, and, and you can write down uh, the Taylor coefficients as multiple integrals uh, that sort of show up in, in, a, in a usual or modified uh, fret home determinant. And I also want to mention, unfortunately, I ran out of time as expected. Uh, you can use then all these tools to study these uh, these analytic functions and diaphragm. That's sort of the goal, right? So we we build up all these tools so that we can learn more about these these functions. Um, and one of the results that uh, that we could get was uh, proving a conjecture of of Borodin and Strahov about the expected value of products of ratios. Um, of these uh, entire functions coming from uh, from the characteristic polynomials. Um, but I'm out of time, so I will just stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Benedek. So we can unmute ourselves and, uh, and thank you uh, all together. <laughs> Okay, so do you have uh, questions or comments? I have one question. Um, is there, um, can, can one describe a, um, a beta to zero limit of the stochastic zeta function? Does it have a simple description? That's That's a very interesting, Question. So there are there are two sort of uh, limits here um, that one can one can study, and Lore knows about this more than probably anybody in this in this room. And then look, you can you can study study these limits. And if you just look at the finite model, then it's of course fairly easy to to understand what happens to these to these uh, beat ensembles. In one case, um, when you said beta equals to zero, you just sort of delete that Vandermont. So that means that uh, your points will become independent. So then for the point process limit, you um, you are expecting to see uh, a Poisson point process, right? So then um, in your question, one would like to see some sort of random entire function with uh, the Poisson point process as the zeros. The other direction, uh, when you go beta equal infinity, that means that the repulsion becomes uh, larger and larger between the points, and everything will crystallize. And in the finite model, you just have n points sort of uh, dividing this, the unit circle exactly, and the only randomness that remains is maybe a random rotation uh, in the picture. And then in the limit, you get this sort of picket fence process or, or random shift. Um, of, uh, of an arithmetic progression, there it's it's easier to understand what happens to the entire function. You just get a, a shifted version of sine 
uh, or cosine, right? Because you have this these periodic periodic zeros, and you can actually make this precise, um, and and you can you can have there the the Dirac operator is just the first derivative operator with this ex extra zero minus one one zero uh, matrix, uh, and the eigenvalues are uh, are just very you can just write them down explicitly. Unfortunately, when you go to the beta equals zero case, it's not clear what happens to the to the operators, and and I don't have uh, a nice uh, sort of uh, model that would include all of these levels. Of course, on the point process level, we understand uh, what happens, and uh, Lore proved uh, this limit of the sine beta process converging uh, to the Poisson uh, Poisson point process. Um, so that you can see that the limiting point process level, not just on the finite point process level, but I don't have a good operator uh, for for the Poisson point process. Uh, so I do have also a question, <laughs> although I could have asked the one of uh, of Guillaume. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, my question is that we have seen. Um, a talk about of uh, Elliot Packet um, like like last month who was describing the same kind of function as you but for the stochastic area operator. Uh, so your descriptions they, they match, right? Or what what's the uh, or can you so our, our models uh, what what I explained with the Dirac operators, those will not include the clay case of Elliot. So Elliot is is working at the soft edge. And at the soft edge, you have this Sturm Neuville operator, which is just basically the Laplace operator plus some potential, linear potential and white noise, right? That's how you get the stochastic area operator. And that doesn't fit into this exact uh, framework. There are some special Sturm Neuville differential operators which can be rewritten as, um, as Dirac operators. So, for example, if you take the hard edge operators, those we can describe, and actually that's something that we, we did with Yoon uh, for a related uh, model on um, related random unitary matrix model. Um, but for uh, for the soft edge, um, it's not it's not immediate. Now uh, there are certainly things that you can you can connect between his world uh, and our sort of uh, framework, um, and I I'm pretty sure that you can you could probably find similar similar statements um, it's a little bit trickier uh, how to how to write the sort of determinant description the airy process is a one-sided process right so there will be a largest point um, so it's uh, it's definitely you you cannot expect that this sort of trees this even that this fake version of trees um, will exist but uh, certainly you know there are ways that one can uh, possibly regularize this, and uh, I believe Balint Virag and and one of his his graduate students are actually working on on an approach uh, that would uh, be sort of that would mimic somehow uh, this particular uh, framework that I just described. Okay, okay, yeah, because you have uh, the representation of um, the uh, stochastic area. Um, operator as a canonical uh, operator right in your paper so i guess uh, is it uh... yeah uh, but again it's a uh, it's a little bit tricky because there uh, this or function yes so it won't be a dirac operator it will be a canonical system which is sort of like the eigenvalue equation for a dirac operator so it it doesn't seem like a mm. big difference you just sort of move one term to the other side um, but it is it is uh, an issue because that or function, the ingredient that I described, will be a rank one matrix, so it won't have an, an inverse. So um, you cannot just uh, repeat everything that that we did uh, in this framework. But I'm I'm hopeful that you can do something similar and and you can extend it to include uh, the soft edge case as well. Okay, thank you. But it's, a, it's a very natural question. It would be, I think, interesting to, to connect these two words. Uh, do you have uh, other questions? 
Okay, uh, so let's thank again uh, Benedek uh, and uh, Emma for the talks this afternoon. Thank you guys. Thank you for spending your pride on <laughs> <laughs>